Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today, we have a panel about uh, emergency response in Central Indian and Eastern Europe. Uh, thank you, Code for All organization, for having us today. Uh, my name is Teresa Gagnon. Uh, I'm from Chesco Digital. I will be moderating this panel, and we will be covering um, the efforts and experience we gained through the uh, large scale crisis. It was the COVID time, it was the recent, uh, the recent uh, crisis uh, uh, caused by the uh, refugee movement uh, caused by the war in Ukraine, which, which affected uh, over 5 million people who had to flee their home and seek uh, safety. Uh, so this is um, the big events that ha have happened and I'm very, very happy and honored to have today within our panel the representatives of the civic tech communities from the Central and Eastern Europe. So let me welcome uh, the first panelist, which is uh, Olivia Vereha, uh, the co-founder and chief operating officer of uh, Code for Romania. Hi, Olivia. Hi, thank you so much for your invitation. I'm glad to be here. Uh, the second uh, panelist we have today, we have Zuza from Tech for the Rescue, which is the project uh, based in Poland. And Zuza is the non-profit relations uh, head and also the, the go-to person for activists uh, from the tech field who are willing to support uh, civic tech projects or um, um, the, the, the projects that are help using technology for public good. So hi, Zuza. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today and uh, being able to discuss with you all of the responses that we did during the recent crisis. Perfect. Thank you so much. And the third one, last but not least, is our Eva Pavlikova, who is representing Chesco Digital, uh, the civic tech from, uh, from Czech Republic, and uh, she's co-founder and also director of our organization. Hi, Eva. Hello. Nice to be here with all of you. I'm looking forward for discussion. Perfect. So I'm very happy we could meet. We could uh, we could reflect what was going through um, in the recent times. We can jump in and just give a brief introduction about your projects, your organization, and your roles. So we can start with Olivia, please. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going first. So Code for Romania has been around for about seven years uh, in the past uh, in the past decade, and we've learned quite a lot uh, in terms of how to how to develop civic tech in uh, in such a specific space such as Eastern Europe. Um, our goal is to provide civil society and institutions uh, with uh, civic tools, civic tech tools that would. Um, support a normal, logical digital transformation process. Uh, however, the past three years have been have been very different for us because we realized we are actually uh, we turned into a role of uh, digital first responders because Romania not having an organization or an institution such as I don't know, for example, gov.uk or US Digital Services, we we had to focus all our support in. Um, designing and building solutions for um, for the two major crises involving also all the stakeholders. So in both COVID and in the uh, Ukraine, most recent Ukraine, Ukraine crisis, we've built the national systems necessary for um, addressing these issues. Uh, so during COVID, we've built an entire ecosystem for managing um, managing information for population and combating disinformation, which were two of the most uh, important problems we were faced with actually, um, and uh, also tracking symptoms and so on and so forth. And during the, um, the Ukraine crisis that is still ongoing, we actually have a team right now uh, at the border doing extra research. So the second round of research in, in the bordering countries. Uh, we've done, we had six missions uh, out of which the first two was to provide in all uh, in four languages information to refugees so what are, everything they've needed from getting into the country uh, finding uh, services they might need from housing up to um, um, up to aid or any other kind of services directed for children we had a lot of children coming in um, second was to equip uh, the authorities that were managing this entire uh, intervention with aid management tools so the first one was for managing housing and um, at this moment, um, every housing effort is done through this platform that we've provided to them. And what's important about this platform is that it's 
uh, it does a lot of validation and it does a lot of checkups in order to ensure that these refugees do not get allocated to any kind of property that might be dangerous for them. So we worked a lot with NGOs working against trafficking and, um, we, we, and with legal experts in order to design this specific, uh, this specific platform. And the second one was managing all types of aid other than housing. So basically transportation, food, and so on and so forth. Our third mission was to provide uh, support for um, the chronically ill, so, and we have a cluster of, of platforms managed by different partners with Code for Romania. One of them is managing children with cancer that are coming in. And once they submit the request, somebody takes them and um, ensures they have a medical doctor, they have a hospital, they have the treatment they need. The, the same goes for HIV patients coming in. Um, we've just launched a um, women's center because we, um, so any type of services re regarding pregnancy, breastfeeding, any kind of uh, services that might require special attention, such as domestic violence, victims, and so on and so forth, they can request help through this platform and also find information. And um, another platform that we're going to launch next week is for multiple sclerosis patients that are coming in. Um, these are the four missions that we've already built and currently administering together either with the state or with civil society, UN agencies, and so on. And uh, the ones that are currently in development are uh, uh, psychological support. And here we work with the veteran affairs in the United States to help us bring uh, PTSD support that we don't really have. We don't have experts for this. So we're trying to bridge this gap by bringing expertise uh, through some digital solutions and also uh, access to, to education, especially we're focusing especially on the ones that the Ministry of Education doesn't, uh, and especially like the older population that needs to get integrated and socialized and they need to start learning the language because that, for children we have uh, schools and things have started to move better, but for the elder population nothing has really been set in place properly. And also, obviously, access to uh, psychological help because this is a growing uh, need um, as people have decided to settle and remain here. So this was in a, in a nutshell uh, what we've done. Like the first platforms were up, like the Dopamoha platform was up in 48 hours after the uh, the war started. The aid management platforms and the housing one have been available within seven days. So it's been a, a huge effort. And unfortunately, it's a, a lesson that I hope that at least this time our authorities are going to learn that you're supposed to build these things and try learn to, to operate them while you're not in a crisis. Um, but I think uh, one, one more important thing that we've managed in this particular crisis is that uh, for the first time, we've managed to bring the stakeholders together, which is a premier for Romania and uh, in many humanitarian spaces around the world is to get for the first time both the UN agencies, the government and the major civil society organizations in the country talk through one single point with one voice towards the refugees in order to build trust and um, facilitate access to information through a single point of content that is way easier to communicate and uh, deliver to the, your target population rather than just disparate information all over the place. Uh, this was in a nutshell. I'm looking forward to the questions and the lessons uh, learned and everything we can share uh, in this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Like just these highlights are super inspirational for, for us, you know, so I am happy you also mentioned like security and the broad spectrum of problems you are tackling. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we we are getting inspired constantly by Romania. So now uh, with the kind of new project Tech to the Rescue, we can ask Olivia um, Zuza for, for the quick intro. Sure. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say, Olivia, it was very inspiring to hear you and especially about different parties coming together to speak one voice, because this is what's very important uh, when it comes to the crisis response. Uh, so we as Tech to the Rescue, we are kind we were kind of born out of the crisis because we started our operations in March 2020 when the pandemic hit Europe, and a couple of IT leaders decided that this is how they can help uh, the public sector, the nonprofit sector. They can volunteer their expertise, their knowledge, uh, their um, IT employees to build together digital solutions that will support the public health sector, right? So what we are doing is we are connecting nonprofits with uh, in need of some digital solutions with IT companies 
who are willing to engage in pro bono projects. Since then, uh, we, managed, we managed to match more than 200 projects from all over the world. Uh, and these are in various different uh, technologies. So some of them are um, regarding website development. Some of them uh, are about cybersecurity. Some of them include data management systems or some e-learning platforms uh, and NFT fundraising, online payments, et cetera. So it all depends on what the nonprofit is looking for. And we are just in the same time searching for a perfect partner that shares the same values and that can support them uh, on this journey to build the solutions together. So um, kind of learning from our experience when we noticed that there were uh, movements from Russian troops on the border of Ukraine, we already reached out to our Ukrainian partners to see if there is any kind of a way that we can support them. Um, and thanks to this kind of attitude that we already reached out to them before, we launched our Tech for Ukraine campaign the day before Russian troops entered Ukraine. So thanks to that, we were kind of kind of prepared. I mean, nobody was prepared to what happened, right? But we were um, trying to reach out to the partners in Ukraine already so that they know that if they need anything, we are here for them to support them. And um, in a couple of days, we had more than 1,000 companies <laughs> joining our network and wanting to help Ukraine. And luckily, um, thanks to this big engagement from IT industry, we were able to help in more than 90 projects already. So this is how it looks from our perspective so far. Thank you so much. The model is very inspirational again as well. So I think we will have more questions later on. Thank you so much. So Eva, if you can take over and talk about our, our project activities and Chesco Digital. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to say, wow, uh, Olivia and Susanna, what, what you said, it's so inspirational. So thank you very much. Um, just a brief how we work in Chesco Digital, because we can see that those um, models are a little bit different. We are here um, three years and a half. Uh, we try to build the teams together from the beginning of the project. So we try to bring the people from NGO, from the government, uh, from the uh, companies like the expert volunteers together, because what we see that the most beneficial is that they, the people work together on the one project. And they can uh, understand their needs and understand they, the way of the work and all that stuff. Uh, we we born uh, before the COVID, COVID crisis, but uh, the COVID and also the Ukraine accelerated our community. And now we are like 5,400 people registered in the Slack. So the people who are willing to help. And we can see that in the peak, the people are hundreds of uh, people work uh, in the same time. From the Czech, Czech Republic context for the uh, Ukraine, we have a, a 10 and a half million of citizens and we welcomed more than 3, 000, uh, 300,000 of the people from Ukraine. So I think that we were one of the, uh, the biggest, uh, uh, the, um, the welcoming people from the Ukraine. Uh, for the, from the perspective what we have done so far, uh, we were focused for two, two things. The first one, when the, the war happened, we were looking for the humanitarian help, right? So we built up uh, some map for the traffic uh, searching of the borders. So what was something that we built up like in one or two days to help NGO to be focused for the traffic of the borders. Later on, um, or in the same time, we've built up um, the, let's see, the main page for us, what was a Stoyme za Ukraino, who somehow bring all the information. If I'm the Czech person and I want to help, so there was a, um, the information um, curated by our um, community that we can uh, give you the information how you can help. Even you help uh, to sending some money or you bring some things what you have for some uh, humanitarian place. So we built up this one. It was uh, over the weekend, I think so, you know, two or three days. And we have uh, bring more than 150 people. 
uh, we build up like, I think that I would roughly say about 10 projects because some of the projects what I can highlight, but some of the projects were created in the community and we didn't even touch what we what have been done in community so far because we just connect the people together and try to tell them, hey, do not uh, work on the separate things, but let put together. What we can see that um, the people were willing to come to the Chesco Digital, uh, to the community. And if I compare with the COVID, when the people wants to help sell them, we, we in Ukraine, we can see that the people were focused. I don't want to build up something alone, but I don't need part of the things and do not uh, they put the energy to the separate things. From some of the projects, what I can mention here, that um, a part of the story as Ukraine, like the website for the, all the help, we have created the UMAPA, which is the application to the mobile phone. And you can, as an Ukraine person, to find your relevant doctor, your relevant school where the people can talk to in Ukraine language. Also, we have uh, created the MOVAP, which is the application also to the web and also to the mobile, like the language help to your pocket that you can very learn um, the Chesko, uh, Ch Czech language to the Ukraine in some natural uh, help as a, as a phrases, right? No, not uh, the dictionary, but the phrases. Also, we have created some of the pilots like the peer-to-peer -to, -peer to connect people from Ukraine and uh, from Chesko to help someone to go, for example, to, do, to the zoo or some, uh, some uh, let's say the um, free time uh, ways uh, with was what pilot. And also that we discussed a lot the depolarization of the society because there was, a, we can see that there was a, a lot of frustration and there will be a lot of frustration. So we've discussed how we can calm the society with this help and with the solidarity. I'm pretty sure that I uh, forgot some of the projects and uh, I'm sorry for this. And we put all the projects um, on the website and we, we said that if anyone wants to join Chesco Digital, please welcome uh, to our Slack and uh, help us. Uh, the last, what I wanna say that from the, the work perspective, we try to motivate all the people to work on the projects with, uh, we are, more like the, the project for the years, not for the moment. Because we can see that um, uh, this is also important for the volunteers to uh, work on the things which are um, to be here for a longer time and what they can contribute. And the last project, what I forgot it and need to mention is the Misto Veškole, which is the project that it's for the Ukrainian children. They, they can look if there is some free place um, on the school because we can see that they are looking for the school because they, we can see that they are be they will be staying in Czech, Czech Republic more time so they will be looking if is an area free free seat for the school so that's it from my side and looking for for discussion and that's it thank you Eva so with that uh, we've seen. I think we've lost Teresa for just and a There second. were many projects, like some were coming. Oh, sorry for that. My connection is unstable. Um, I just said that some projects were covering short-term needs. Some projects have longer-term value. So this, this we discussed. We also mentioned the stakeholders that we were work, working with, NGOs and um, also volunteers. Years. This was the crisis in the Ukrainian, where we used also some So let's see how gonna unstable be, because it's okay. the first attempt. <laughs> <laughs> it's the third attempt, yes. So it's getting like the normal attempt. Um, so let's see. Um, I think I, I'd like to take the opportunity up until Teresa actually manages to uh, to reconnect. And um, I have a question, uh, Susanna, because you were born and your organization was born right in the moment when a major crisis started. So 
How has it been? Did you have any kind of moments? What were the challenges to get into like a normal mission driven activity in between maybe these two two crises? How what were the challenges for you? Uh, Oh, there were many, I would say. <laughs> I mean, starting from the fact that because we were so crisis focused at the beginning, so these were our main activities. We were doing a lot of work connecting to uh, helping as quickly as possible without doing this backyard work, like establishing processes, uh, coming up with some best practices, preparing all of the documentation. So because of that, there was a lot of manual work at the beginning. But this year we managed to uh, overcome this and um, kind of clean up some of our internal procedures as well. And it was also thanks to the um, great opportunity that we had as we were granted a fellowship from google.org and we were supported by their help in scaling our activities. So. I think Teresa is back with us, so maybe your connection is better now and we can continue. I hope so, yeah. Um, so I, I feel you you are discussing like the, the boundaries or bottlenecks that you faced during the during the project. Uh, do, do you uh, want also to share some um, best practice like the project that went real well and you feel has potential for long-term value, like for long-term impact? Sure, I can go first, <laughs> as my mic is unmuted. Um, so I would say that because we as Tech to the Rescue, we are not engaging directly in projects, right? We are connecting two parties to work on them. Um, so because of that, we had more than 90 projects related to Ukraine. And it's really hard to pick the most inspirational one. I personally, I think they're all, they are all amazing. Some of them are small, some of them are very big, uh, some of them are short term, which was needed as a lot of NGOs, for example, before the war, they were focusing more on cultural, cultural activities. And now they, because of the war, they had to transform into humanitarian aid organizations. And they, they were needing those solutions that they will use only for now, not in the future, but still they needed the support, right? Um, so... I don't want to talk about specific technology that I think is very inspirational, more about the operating or cooperating models that I, I thought were uh, good examples. So one of them was UASOS. It's a platform for finding accommodation in Poland, Czech, uh, Slovakia, and Hungary, as I remember now. And what was inspirational about it is that it was built by a number of NGOs and a number of tech companies cooperating together to quickly respond to the crisis that we met. So as we know, it's not easy to coordinate work of different organizations. And that's why I think it's really amazing that although it was like a dozen of entities working together, they still found because of the purpose, the mission, they found common language and they created the solution together. And the second um, project that I think is uh, really a good example of best practice for tech industry in the future, it was one for Map We Pomod Spell, which is a map where you can see different institutions offering help in Poland uh, regarding Ukraine. So you can see what other institutions are doing and maybe exchange some services in between you. But what is um, interesting about it is that it, it was started by a cultural NGO. They, did, they didn't have experience and they didn't have a clear idea about the project. They thought it would be a bit smaller scale one. And then it turned out that there was a big need for it and they were supported by UNHCR as well. Um, so the tech company at the beginning, they kind of pledged their support for a very small technical issue, but then it turned out that there are more needs and the project needs to grow and develop further. And the company showed a lot of flexibility and continue as a long-term partner with this NGO, you know, changing their attitude and giving more engineers if needed, you know, and just trying to respond uh, in a timely manner, in, in a timely manner to the needs that NGO is showing. If I can, then maybe the question, because I think as you as Zuza mentioned, um, uh, I think that we are 
in Czech, uh, Czech, uh, Czech Digital and also in Czech Republic in a, in a different situation that uh, we've, we've seen that a lot of energy with the COVID, right? Because yep. we have um, spent a lot of time in the, in the crisis of the COVID and we, we've brought a lot of uh, companies and also a lot of people. What we can see uh, is that, and maybe Oliver has mentioned, is that how to change from the situation as a crisis emergency to the standard way and how to measure the impact, yeah? Because also what we can see in Czech Republic, and I'm not sure how it is in, um, in your countries, but we can try to, we can, we can see that there is a lot of energy and that there is a lot of need uh, to create this energy together. But if we come to the discussion about the impact, uh, we are a bit in a struggle because many projects that are in very long term are somehow um, very useful and we see how useful are but we are trow and I, mm, we are not sure how to explain it with the impact because the impact only how many people will help in any crisis. So I'm not sure if there is any space to discuss it, but I just want to point it out that uh, I remember from our situation that we are getting mm, the second crisis uh, with, with, uh, with the Ukraine. We are thinking how to um, explain this impact for the society from the long-term perspective. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, but I won't be able to answer this question. As you know, we are also facing the same <laughs> questions and the same doubts. And we were focusing a lot this quarter on creating like an impact measurement scheme um, to be able to better track uh, both the influence of our organization, but also the influence of the projects that we are doing and the influence on uh, IT industry and NGO industry. And I think it's a very complex uh, topic and uh, I'm very happy that you brought it because maybe somebody has some good experience to share with us. So uh, I will intervene also because this is really connected to like the challenges questions coming in from Teresa. So um, a first way of uh, it, everything has two parts. So the first part is to ensure that these projects continue to be used. So be it a platform or a mobile application or a system or an ecosystem, like the way we're building things here in Romania, we need to make sure that these turn into like the official system for aid management, the official system for information and so on. And this you can do, I don't know if it's valid also for, for the Czech Republic and Poland, but this you do through legal constraints. So I'm giving you all this free stuff and all this technology that is top notch and it's up to standard and we're going to help you maintain it and we're going to train your personnel and we're going to we're going to help you adopt it at a national level as long as you commit to using it for the next at least four to five years, because in four to five years, everybody's going to be so embedded in that technology that they're not going to give it up anymore. So for us, one of our strategies in making sure that the systems we're building and this is how we managed to get to a, a 44 live solutions up and running at any moment in time is through these kind of legal assessments that we get them to sign beforehand. So we do, we do not start working until we get commitment. That's one, because again, working with volunteers and working also with full-time employees, because full-time employees can also get frustrated and, and not being able to provide them with the certainty that their work is going to be used and is going to produce a long-term change or a systemic change it's a problem. So what we're really, we're the weird ones in our civil society space. We're the ones with the contracts, with the agreements, with the, no, nobody likes us because we do a lot of paperwork and we're doing it just exactly because we're trying to make sure that the projects don't die. And second, measuring impact for us, it's also been really hard to figure out how to talk, first of all, with funders to explain to them because all the funders are used to how many beneficiaries, how many people did you feed, how many people did you put clothes on and so on and so forth. It's really hard for them to understand what civic technology does and the fact that you empower other actors to actually have an impact in the long run. So one, one of the ways in which we're doing it is getting the ones we support with tech to speak about what this has meant for their organizations. So, okay, I may not have accurate numbers, but I can definitely um, have someone say, okay, because I have this tool, this, I don't know, donor management tool or volunteer management tool, I have managed to grow my capacity to handle 
three times more volunteers than I did before, or I'm assisting, I have a system because now I have a case management system. Currently, uh, I have reduced my bureaucratic and paperwork time in my NGO with 50% or 75%. And this allows me to assist five times more, uh, more victims. So from this perspective, we're trying to, to actually speak, not necessarily just believe me, I'm, I'm, I'm doing impact. <laughs> I'm just bringing the ones that are using the tech to actually say how their lives have changed and how their work has changed in the past uh, since they started using the tech. And another measurement for us is we took a lot of our time to explain to them that you cannot measure the same app the same way. So, for example, we have the election monitoring app, the one that has also been used in Poland and has been scaled to other countries. And we said, okay, if I tell you that I had 500 election uh, observers using my app, you're going to say, yeah, but for COVID, you had 40 million unique users. It's a big difference. Yeah, but I had 500 out of 520 total observers. So I had an adoption rate of 98%. So you bringing context to every result we're reporting really helps a lot because otherwise they're just going to look at it it's like oh you have five NGOs using this yeah I have five NGOs in my entire country that do this I mean I have them all so my, my success rate you can say it's a hundred percent so it, it's a lot of it's a lot of back and forth in getting people to actually understand a lot of patience in working with everybody and getting somebody else to talk about your work and not yourself because then uh, they can really understand how it translates in terms of beneficiaries assisted and, and so on and so forth. For us, the biggest challenge during the, the, the crisis and working with civil society and both government was to make sure the tech was the easy part. And it's always the easy part. Building the solutions is just, it, it's tech, it's engineering. We know what we have to do. The problem is with making sure the adoption is as high as possible. This is why we've slept to <laughs> near the border. This is why we have a 24 seven line for everybody working with the government that is currently servicing through our apps and so on. So being able to bring those people not afraid, not to not be afraid of technology anymore is, is really a lot of effort. And it's, it's really way more time and energy consuming than building the tech itself. But it's really important because once the executants are actually on board, the decision maker will also say, okay, I can't ignore, I can ignore an NGO at any moment in time, but I can't ignore my own employees. So this, this was really, it was a hard road. We're still, we're still walking it, but it's, it's really working. It's the only thing that really worked. Thank you, Olivia. Like this, what you describe is like scaling the infrastructure, right? Which will have long-term impact, not only in crisis, it will help NGOs long-term. That's what we, we are on the same page, I would say 100%. And my question is, um, when, um, how, what, what did you use? Like this question to everybody, what, what criteria you used to enter the projects, like to accept the projects? Like you mentioned that you, re you require to have some commitment from uh, stakeholders that it will be used. So is there any other rules that you apply? Uh, I'll go first because we're kind of different. So I'm sure Susanna has, I'm really looking forward to figure out how they're working with their project. But for us, um, we do not accept projects. We have an entire research and design team that is working uh, with uh, subject matter experts and decide what needs to be implemented. Uh, and then volunteers can jump in and work on this one or this one or that one. But we do not have a, a, a coming in with a project kind of policy unless that project that let's say somebody sending an email, they want to build a jobs platform. If we have that uh, in our backlog, then yes, let's work together. But otherwise, we always work based on our key findings and research on the ground rather than uh, taking in projects uh, and assessing them. Yeah, so we at Tech to the Rescue, we definitely uh, work a bit different, but I love the idea that you were sharing about the signing of the commitment to use the technology for far, four to five years. We are not using that, and this is also for a particular reason. I mean, some of our projects are short term, and just because of that, you know, the technology is not being used for a longer time. For example, some NGOs just need a mobile app for a specific campaign that they will be doing for a year or two, right? So we cannot expect them to use the technology for a longer time. What we are checking when we are um, encouraging NGOs to submit their 
projects is their legal status if they are a registered nonprofit. So we are not at this moment, we are not helping grassroots organizations because for us, this also means that um, with grassroots organizations, sometimes they disappear after a couple of months because you know they, they run out of energy and people willing to support the uh, idea, the, the, the activities that they were doing. And with registered NGOs, the risk of having that situation is much lower. But apart from that, we at Tech to the Rescue, we kind of try to curate this um, mindset that all of the projects, they kind of um, earn the right to have a pro bono digital solution in the sense that all of the change makers should be empowered by technology to do what they're doing best, whether it's on a small scale because they're a small NGO working only on the you know, district in the city and that's it for a very specific group of people or they're international big corporate NGOs that are helping half of the world, right? And um, we are just kind of supporting, um, offering the platform where tech companies and NGOs can meet. So the tech companies, it's up to them to choose in which project they want to engage. So they can look for various different projects. Of course, we are also reaching out to them uh, directly and we are, trying to propose to them the best fit uh, for them, but this is up to them to make a decision that this project is in line with their values, that they have expertise to do it and that they have enough time to complete it. If I can edit from our side, um, from the volunteers perspective, we are open to everyone, even that it was coming uh, Sorry. Um, from volunteer, we are welcoming everyone. Even there was some, maybe the um, advice uh, to uh, get some money from the company, but we want to be uh, inclusive for everyone to who is willing to help. Uh, from the project perspective, uh, we try to be focused for the nonprofit as an official way. And uh, we are required to help have someone involved from the um, nonprofit as an expert and in the agile uh, methodology is like the product owner. So we want to have someone who is really involved and who bring the knowledge from the expertise field what we uh, will be helping. Within the, within the crisis, with the emergency response, we are discussing that we more focused for someone who wanna have the energy and who wanna create the project himself and who will um, be have time to end up the project, right? Because because in, in the emergency response, you some of the issues what you are looking for, they there is no any NGO yet. So we uh, more, more more focused for the people who are willing to sort it out the project. And even some of the projects, what we build up is it was like two to two, two or five days um, for the build up. So it was no needed to looking for the NGO. I also want to edit uh, what Zuzana mentioned for the discussion about the, um, uh, the company. Uh, I remember one point, it was not from Ukraine, but it was um, from the COVID that when we helped with the, with the schools, with the digitalization, and we helped more than 600 of the schools, which is 10% of all schools in Czech Republic, we, we try to somehow manage the risk that there will be some companies where what they are looking for the business, not for the easier help. So we were somehow looking that there we will not, uh, let's say, support the business looking for the pre-sale, but there is really the help from the community and there is no any requirement in the future or something that we, we bring the technology to the NGO, but the NGO need to pay for this solution for together. So this is also what I want to mention that for some of the time there are, um, the, the companies are coming to us, but we are trying to be restricted in the way that if you want to looking for the business, do not work with us. If you want to help, you, you are very welcome. But if you're looking for the business, you need to split it out because we don't want to be that who put the, the commitment for the NGO for the future. And for example, if we build up the difficult solution, 
from the developer perspective, for example, it's like that needed some coding skills and the, and the NGO will not be able to make it, we are in the trouble because we put a wrong recommendation. So this is just one I want to help that it's a kind of the balance, the community, and also to have developed uh, expert volunteers, but not for the pre survey. Thank you, Eva. And we had some questions, and I saw that Can Olivia and Susa answered them. I have a curiosity in terms of um, because I think the the model is is amazing. I'm not sure if you can hear me properly. Is my internet all right? All right. Uh, how do you handle uh, like the side uh, the side services? So, for example, if a project somebody working in an IT company gives a development team and they build a project for an NGO, who's how do you handle the NGO's need for like servers or? long-term kind of costs implied by that project do you have a mechanic do the does the company take a commitment for that also i was just curious how how it works um so when ngo is submitting a project to us at least we always ask them if they have any budget and we are asking them about how they are planning to maintain the solution uh, do they have an IT expert on board that can, you know, take care of the website in the future, or should we create a website that it will be easy to handle, even if you don't have IT expertise, right? Um, and then if the, we also always support them with a template for agreement between NGO and the tech company. So in this agreement, they can always write down who is taking care of which architecture for the solution. If I can add from our perspective, Chesco Digital, um, as we do the long-term projects, is the communication between uh, us and the NGO, and we are trying to uh, explain them uh, what going to be the additional costs. So we are discussing. Uh, in some some of the time, we also put um, our budget, for example, to host some services by us, for example, for for one year. And um, also um, with the with, with the crisis project, with the emergency project, what we are discussing, we are trying to looking uh, for the very light solution. What they do not need the servers or the physical ways, or we are looking that the project should end up, for example, with the government, right? Because some of the projects what we build build up should be done by the government, not by us. So we are looking for the end beneficiary of this project and we try to communicate with advance if they have some place, if they have some budget. Thank you so much. It's, it's really interesting to see it as different models because this is also a question of scaling because Teresa was asking us about how do we scale, what can we scale from these things? And for example, currently we're looking at, for example, scaling our humanitarian ecosystem to Moldova, to maybe Poland, to Hungary, and so on. And one of the main questions is how do we ensure maintenance as well as security concern, addressing security concerns, and not just the Russian hackers who are coming to attack us, but also in terms of like day to day data protection, because most of the NGOs have rather low digital literacy levels and how do we manage to grow their literacy such as they protect data properly especially vulnerable population data and so on so um, in terms of, of scaling this is one of our major concerns every time we do we replicate a project to a different country or to a different space we're trying to figure out exactly what the infrastructure capacity of that country is so uh, thank you for answering Yeah, thank you, Olivia, for jumping to our last part, which is how to scale. And this can be done via the network, via replicating to other countries. It can be also when we build the tools open source. So we are opening it for the whole community. So I just wanted to open this topic to discuss, like, if you if you have any ideas, what could be uh, you are already, Olivia, working on it. We are also having first projects that are uh, cross country relevant or expanding. Um, also with our panel today, as we are getting to be closing it in a few minutes. So I'm happy we are in touch and I think this will create another another um, connections that we will 
we will be able to 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 be in touch uh, and and share more and more projects uh, in the long run. So, opening the last topic, um, I think as for Chesco Digital, we can mention we built some projects that that are open source that we are willing to willing to offer um and we feel that they will bring value it's it's the move up app that eva mentioned already this is the language learning app for example so is there anything else you you have on, on your mind or how to scale our activities i i can jump in with just a very very short um, idea on scaling i think what's really important is uh it's wonderful that we're here and we find out exactly with the internal mechanics of each of our organization but we also need to figure out how we bring in the rest of civil society because we're the techies we're the nerds we're coming in with the, all the support necessary but we definitely have to figure out a way to capacitate the civil society on the ground to actually make use of the tech. So let's say if tomorrow I'm going to Moldova and I'm scaling the entire ecosystem, I need to understand exactly what's the landscape in terms of civic, uh, civil society and institutions on the ground to make sure that the solutions I'm bringing in are actually going to do the job. Because, and in terms of tech, my only piece of advice with scaling is like always build having in mind that what, tomorrow they, somebody else might need it. Somebody else speaking another language, somebody else, uh, maybe somebody with disabilities needs it. So building up to standards like international standards in terms of internationalizations, accessibility and like code best practices is the best way to ensure that if you want to scale or replicate, uh, you don't have to worry that the tech is going to be able to do it in, in record time. And you should focus on coalition building and, and getting people on the ground to actually use it. Yes, that, that's the big truth that uh, making coalitions like across the ecosystem, it doesn't have to be tech only, it can be also other players on the field. Perfect. We, we Do you want to share, Zuza, any strategies you have for scaling or Eva, you want to uh, add something else? I can open for you. I, I mean, I, <clears throat> I agree with Olivia and what she mentioned. So um, yeah, it, the most important thing is having in mind a bigger picture and creating the solutions that can be lasting. And um, also, on the other hand, I think for the when the crisis is happening, sometimes what the NGOs are needing, it doesn't have to be overthinked. It doesn't have to be a very complicated, big solution, but only a very simple one that they can use temporary because they need it only for this couple of weeks or couple of months and they will not be uh, using it permanently, right? So it can also be some ready-made solutions that can be easily adapted by different organizations with no IT expertise on board. Um, but what I personally think is uh, very important is for us to stay in touch, for all of the civic uh, society organizations to exchange information, to talk to each other, to learn more about different experiences that we went through, different needs that we are met with every day, to see where is the, there is an opportunity for some collaboration um, and where we can join forces and work together on creating solutions that will be then employed in different countries. So um, yeah, if I can add it uh, from uh, my side, um, the first one uh, would jump into my mind because I spoke uh, or talked to my team uh, today and um, I've got an um, experience from the discussion about the creating of the open source program office here in Czech Republic. And we've discussed with some experience from Sweden and from US. And what came to my mind that we want to, or we are not in the situation that the PPP project in some technology is something normal, right? Because we can see that we can very, very well create a PPP project means public private public partnership in building the roads, but we are not having the PPP project as a normal, for example, for this using the technology or for the education. So from my side, this could be one of the potential way how we can uh, show on the concrete way, not on the technology, but also some of the projects that this cooperation between the government and the private and um, civic society is something normal. Um, the second one is that um, I'm still looking that if there will be any way uh, apart the education, right? Because we can see that um, 
there is very much need to have the education or meet the experience with the technology. And this is what we can see that in Czech Republic, at least, is just becoming more important, right? And this could be also the good way how we can learn and cooperate because also the education is important for the private, also for the, gov uh, for the government and also for the NGO. And the last one is or what I want to mention from the scale up um, is that um, I would very likely to have some project uh, where we together work with, as a code for all, because if we want to, let's say, force our government to cooperate with us, we also want to show them that we are able to cooperate as a very big coalition. So this is what I'm looking at. I'm not sure because there is a specific need a part of the country, but I'm pretty sure that some of one project would also can help us to show our power, how important is that what we are doing um, in the civic, civic society and also the technology. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's uh, very important to have uh, connection and voice for the government or um, as a network. I, I have to echo this. And uh, we had also some very interesting questions. Like I really enjoyed uh, the one. Like, do we do we take it into account the user? You know, like the the question is very important. So thank you for responding. That that's definitely a great question. And uh, I think um, I think this is. Um, something we learned along the way or we know that we should not miss the the, the end users and not not overlook look the real needs and in chesco digital we really uh, have as one of the criteria to be in touch with ngos that are holding the relationship with the um, with the end um, uh, and or target target groups so um thank you for responding that and i think we always we can confirm that we have the end users part of the game right Another question was uh, for for Zuza, like the um, the overview of the projects that you have, because you are really scaling it, scaling the um, uh, kind of connections between companies and NGOs. I think all the crisis helped us all to talk to tech companies, and they all are willing to help and provide some capacities. It's becoming normal. We are getting inspired by Western Europe and America, where this is kind of. Uh, standard. So, if you want to add something, Zuza, for this, or Olivia, because you you also um, have a, a, a really large community and companies involved. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, at Tech to the Rescue, our mission, long term goal, is to make pro bono projects uh, industry standard among IT companies. So, this is how it works with law companies right now, right? Every law office is kind of engaging in those pro bono projects on a smaller or bigger scale. And we wanted the same situation for IT industry. Um, and we see that there are more and more companies that are really willing to introduce those practices into their organizations. Sometimes they just don't have processes to do that. They don't know how to engage. Uh, they're coming to us. They're saying, OK, we want to work on some project. We want to help the world. But how do we do it? Like, what kind of engagement model should we use, right? How can we, on one hand, allow for our employees to engage in those projects? And on the other hand, you know, not to distract them from the normal commercial work that they still need to do, right? Yes, this is the same for us in, in the, the model we have in Code4, where anybody can come in and just grab a task and so on and just log maybe in an internal system some hours that they've put in for, for working on a civic tech project has really helped us in engaging and not just having sponsors, but also really engaged companies that do contribute to projects in the long run. We can definitely echo this for Chesco Digital. I, I, I think we are on the same page with Eva. Um, I, I just wanted to slowly go to the final and just um, I hope, you know, I wanted to close it with the, with the saying, we, we don't like crisis. We hope there will be some some quieter time very soon, uh, which which we, which we 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 are hoping for. Uh, on the other hand, I think we learned uh, during these times like how to keep our energy somehow stable and um, the effort we put into these things. So, if you want to share any 
inside how you are um, working with the energy or how you are recharging or some kind of tips on uh, on this from this area we're always coming back to our our motto from it's been here seven years and it's kept us motivated which is we are the ones we've been waiting for so somebody's got to do it and we really got tired of waiting for somebody else to do it for us so wherever we'll be needed uh, we're going to intervene so for us it's back to back to the drawing board and our initial why we do this kind of uh, kind of motivation mechanism thank you Yes, for us, the motivation is very similar. I think every time we have this kind of uh, lower energy levels and uh, being pessimistic about how much is still there to be done, right? How much work is still in front of us. Then we have an NGO reaching out to us and, you know, their messages from them and the way that those solutions that for us were kind of a quick fix, a very small thing that we were always thinking like, should we, should we even engage? And then they were saying like, it changed our life, you know, thanks to this website, we found a donor that comes and supports us and, you know, or things like that. This is always inspiring and giving us more energy to work. I must only add that um, to, to discuss with uh, every volunteer and with um, every NGO is very inspiring because the, they we can see that this is nothing with the uh, to the money and all the stuff, but it's all like the purpose driven, right? Talk to people about the purpose driven is so inspiring in uh, in life, and from the energy perspective, uh, we discussed a lot uh, also in Chesco Digital um, because uh, we have a uh, the pay team who is going to put in all the energy. And um, I think what helped me, me personally, is to go outside of the organization. Because we can see that what we see as a small steps in the organization are very big step what the, what the people from outside of organization. Yeah, so this helped me a lot to have a look back, uh, for example, for the digitalization of Czech, Czech Republic. We can see that we are only small steps but when we see that we are creating this digital agency, what's gonna be help for the, all the government, I can see that it's very big step what is happening, right? So outside, go outside of the organization and talk to people from the different bubble, always help me a lot. Perfect, thanks so much. So once again, um, it was amazing panel. I think um, it was a kind of relief to reflect after, after those um, those that, that intense that intense intense year 2022. I'm also happy we are connected in the Code for All network, and also we are open to other uh, organizations that are part of the part of this system, so that we can share our experience. I think there were some others who were watching us online. So thanks again for all those who were. Um, commenting, asking questions or at, uh, watching our panel. And thanks again much, Olivia, for your time, for your insights. Thanks, Zuza, for your experience and uh, the model that is very inspirational. And thanks, Eva, for being being us today with us. So um, sharing also how we fight in Chesco Digital. Thank you so much. We are closing slowly, so. Yes, thank you all. It was a pleasure discussing with you. And uh, I hope that we'll have more opportunities like that in the future. Definitely. Thank you so much. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.